as of January 31st, 2023, adults 18 and over in British Columbia will no longer be subject to criminal charges for the possession of up to 2.5 grams of certain illegal drugs for personal use, and the drugs will not be confiscated. Hello, this is the Dr. Junkie Show, and I'm Ben Boyce, host, critic of the war on drugs, and longtime user. And today's episode is about the worldwide war on drugs, which in some places doesn't even exist. If you live in the United States, you probably just assume everywhere else on Earth treats drug users the same way we do. But they don't. And the differences in drug policy create differences in how addiction and drug use play out. So today, let's look at how the rest of the planet treats drugs and those who use them. As I was wrapping up this episode, British Columbia and Canada announced a move to begin a three-year experiment in decriminalization of small amounts of opioids, cocaine, methamphetamine, and MDMA. Their stated goal is to combat a record number of overdose deaths by undoing some of the stigma that users experience on a daily basis. Stigma that makes many of us avoid treatment. This is Canada's Federal Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, Carolyn Bennett, who you heard in the intro. This is not the one single bullet, the one single thing that will reverse this crisis, but we have seen clearly how important it is that this, along with the advancements that we're making in safer supply, will make a difference in curbing the tragedy that we have seen. I have always been committed to supporting people who use drugs, and one complex piece of this solution is this exemption that allows us to start doing that work. That's a far cry from what we usually hear from politicians in the United States. So let's start with the United States, in much of the so-called Western world. I'm sure you've heard by now that drug overdose deaths are currently blowing past 108,000 every year in the United States. That's according to the CDC. That's a 1,600% increase since 1980, the year that I was born, just to put this in perspective. The United States also spends around $300 billion, with a B, on the criminal justice system every year. And a lot of that money is devoted to the drug war. Nearly half of everyone who's incarcerated in a federal prison facility, and nearly a fifth of those who are in state prisons or local jails, are doing time for drugs. And that doesn't even include people like me, who are arrested for stealing or other nonviolent crimes that are clearly related to our drug use. Those crimes don't classify us as addicted people or drug users. We're just common thieves. United States police officers currently arrest someone for a drug crime almost every 30 seconds. But not at random. All drug users are not equally as likely to be caught up in legal conflicts related to their use in the United States. If you wind up in prison here, you're probably poor. Rich folks are arrested far less for drug crimes, they're charged with less serious crimes, they receive less serious charges, and they're ultimately sentenced to less time in prison for the same amount of drugs. And of course, in the United States, any issue of money is also an issue of race because we never did the work to set the scales right after the Civil War. So black folks and other non-white groups are still more likely to be born into poverty than white folks, which just means they're more likely to be arrested and sent to prison for drugs, even if you discard any racism that still informs our current policing. But as messed up as all of that is, it's not the real focus of today's episode. Our failures in the United States, which we sometimes appear to be determined to make permanent, They're unacceptable in a lot of countries, and the difference between them and us is the real topic of today's episode. Now, of course, the U.S. isn't the only country that continues to wage war on our own citizens. I've talked about President Rodrigo Duterte of the Philippines before, who's bragged about groups of police officers he has running around the country murdering people who they think are using or selling drugs, then dumping their bodies in the street as a message to others. We have three million, according to Pedia, three million drug addicts. Not counting mine, because it's still going on. If we do not interdict this problem, the next generation will be having a serious problem. You destroy my country, I'll kill you. 
if you destroy our young children, I will kill you. That is a very correct statement. Duterte actually ran for office on a platform that promised to do exactly what he's done. He's described drug users as irredeemable, and he's even encouraged strangers to kill them because, quote, getting their parents to do it would be too painful. But there's good news on that front, kind of. Duterte's time in office ended in June of 2022. The bad news is his legacy will be carried on by his daughter, Sarah Duterte, who was elected vice president alongside a newly elected president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., a man whose parents were ousted from power in 1986 for human rights abuses and stealing billions of dollars from taxpayers which were never recovered. The one thing that he was very assertive about was that ituloy mo yung, yung anti-drug uh, syndicate na sinimulango. Do it your own way. He really said that. He, Do it your own way. Uh, so that, uh, I, I fully appreciate what he, what he said. And of course, the drug, problem, the, the drug problem in the country continues to, to be a problem. And so we must continue to look that way. In other words, for the foreseeable future, much like in the United States, the Philippines' war on drugs will likely continue as is, taking lives and creating more addicted people in their wake friends and family members who turn to drugs while dealing with the grief of losing a loved one. That shouldn't count as success. So what would happen if we just legalized all drugs? That's the real question, right? And nowadays, it's getting harder and harder for anti-drug warriors to ignore a growing list of evidence of exactly how good things get when drugs are legalized. So let's start in the United Kingdom where for a long time, drug users have had a much easier time finding a legal supply for their drugs. There have been numerous projects in England where drug users are prescribed daily doses of drugs by doctors, everything from morphine to Vicodin-like painkillers to straight-up heroin. If you've been listening to this show for any amount of time, you know this is the same basic system which persisted in the United States until the early 1900s, when doctors stopped helping addicted people for fear of being arrested. Nowadays, it's often called the British system. And damn if it didn't work. There were only 328 people who were known to be addicted to heroin in all of Great Britain in 1964, back when heroin could be obtained with a prescription. In the United States at the same time, hundreds of thousands of people were already struggling with addiction. And our laws were a big part of the problem. Dr. Marx is the most popular story of a medical heroin program in England, and his show tremendous results. But he's not the only one in his country to gain approval for these experiments. In Dr. Marx's experiment, which ran for around 10 years beginning in 1985, he just gave users daily supplies of heroin and then sent them on their way. And he noticed that their lives got better. Plus, they used a lot less street heroin. It's not hard to explain why. For him, that was success, and I think his patients would probably agree, especially compared to where we are right now. He wasn't trying to fix their childhood trauma overnight or magically make their desire to use drugs disappear. He just wanted to improve their quality of life, and in that regard, his program was a huge success. In the 1990s, Switzerland tried the British system, and researchers noted similar results. Needlefield parks cleared up because users had safe spaces to use their drugs and no reason to discard needles in public since they were no longer a crime. New cases of HIV and other infectious disease contracted from needle sharing fell, along with crimes that were related to drug use. But again, Switzerland's goal wasn't abstinence or reduction in doses over time. They weren't forcing people to stop using. They just wanted to make sure that people who use drugs didn't find themselves encountering barriers to their success, which other people avoided. And what do you know? When you don't force drug users to jump through hoops and run from the law while paying way too much for an illegal cut product, we're bound to escape a lot of the barriers to our success, which we otherwise encounter on a daily basis. By the way, Tim Rhodes is the researcher who writes a lot about the concept of policies and social norms which worked to make the lives of drug users a lot more difficult. He calls it a structural risk environment. So check out his work if you want to read more. It's linked in the episode description. So anyway, in Switzerland, like in England before, 
Doctors could write people prescriptions for reasonable daily doses of opioids like heroin and hydrocodone, along with other drugs. But they couldn't do that without first taking the time to talk to their patients, to offer alternative options, to discuss safe use, to offer therapy and treatment. All the things doctors should do. In those discussions, along with safe supply, are what activists here in the United States and abroad call harm reduction. We don't want doctors to give out heroin to anyone who walks past. But like in Switzerland and England, we need medical professionals to write limited prescriptions to those who are going to use these drugs anyway, one way or another. And while they write those prescriptions, they inevitably have a chance to chat with their patients, to offer alternatives, to screen them for mental health and medical issues. That's harm reduction. And every time it's been used anywhere on the planet, it's worked. In both Switzerland and England, following the allowing of legal methods to get drugs, HIV infection rates fell, overdose and crime decreased, and users who normally spent the day running the streets and hiding out to use their illegal drugs, they instead started to do normal things like go to work and go to school. I've also discussed Portugal on the show before. They took a somewhat similar route in 2001 although they push hard to get people on methadone and suboxone prescribed by doctors instead of heroin. At the time when Portugal changed its laws, one in a hundred people living there was estimated to be struggling with heroin addiction. More than half of everyone in prison in Portugal was there for drugs, and HIV infection from drug use was higher than anywhere else in Europe. If you want more specifics about Portugal's drug policy, check out episode 92. But the short story is that it worked better than anyone expected. They went from 1% of the population being addicted to heroin to 0.2% of the population being addicted to heroin. A massive decrease. HIV and hepatitis contracted from sharing needles went down from 52% of all contracted cases in 2000 to just 7% of all contracted cases in 2015. In Portugal, methadone vans now travel the streets at all hours of the day and night, handing out medication to users who would otherwise take some other form of opioids. And as weird as it might seem, this is the most interesting part that shows up over and over, a lot of people in Portugal actually just stopped using altogether. That's the part that usually makes people twist their faces up in confusion. Legalizing and regulating drugs reduces addiction and overall use of hard drugs. In 2001, around 100,000 people in Portugal were addicted to heroin. By 2015, only 25,000 people were addicted in the entire country. Those of us who have been addicted understand why this happened. When you have a safe daily supply and a stable network of friends and treatment, you deal with life slowly but surely. And eventually, you usually reduce or halt your heavy use outright on your own. Overdose deaths fell too in Portugal. And they open safe use sites where people are allowed to come in and use their drugs without fear of arrest. There still hasn't even been a single overdose death at any site on earth. They're only allowed to exist in 11 countries right now though. And the United States only recently allowed two to open in New York, although they're not federally approved yet. The U.S. is on this rapidly shrinking list of countries who have not yet voiced their intent to even update their drug laws and end the war on drugs. In 2013, Uruguay legalized cannabis nationwide. In 2017, Norway announced its intentions to follow Portugal's lead and decriminalize all drugs, although they haven't quite worked out the details in their legislation yet. And slowly but surely, to be fair, Parts of the U.S. are rethinking old bad drug policies, starting with the state of Oregon, who effectively decriminalized small quantities of all drugs in February of 2021. But none of that is enough, and it's not even the best example we can look to nearby for what we should be doing. Remember, this episode started with Canada. In January of 2019, Canada began its first safe supply pilot program. They started giving hydromorphone, aka Dilaudid, to a number of opioid users in British Columbia. And it didn't take long for the evidence to start piling up, indicating improvements in quality of life, reduction in diseases contracted, 
and reductions in the use of illegally purchased drugs. That was all before COVID-19 hit. Everything stopped when that damn virus brought the same supply-related social and cultural issues to Canada as it did to the rest of the world, which for those of us who use drugs includes an entire extra list of dangers and hurdles to our success. In the United States, the government began filing lawsuits against drug companies and big pharmacies, scaring some doctors and pharmacists into thinking twice before writing or filling prescriptions for opioids and other controlled substances. But the suit was filed against members of the Sackler family who founded Purdue Pharma. The drug company is best known for producing the painkiller OxyContin. But now suing the big box retailer for allegedly making the opioid epidemic worse. The DOJ says that many Walmart pharmacists knowingly gave out millions of prescription painkillers to people who did not need them. A the jury found a Hamilton doctor guilty today of charges that he illegally wrote prescriptions for pain pills and caused the death of one patient. Relatedly, the streets became awash in unpredictable doses cut with all sorts of fentanyls and opioid enhancers, like xylazine. But Canada took a different approach. Their pilot program had been up and running for a year, and when COVID-19 hit, the Canadian government looked at that limited data and released updated risk mitigation guidelines in March of 2020. They encouraged physicians across the country to prescribe drugs like morphine, amphetamines, benzodiazepines, in other pharmaceuticals to, quote, support a reduced risk of withdrawal, exposure to COVID-19, and exposure to a limited and toxic drug supply. This was groundbreaking. So these patients who have now been receiving this care from their regular medical providers for years, as expected, they show the same improvements in quality of life and ability to succeed at goals is always happens when users are given safe, legal, affordable supplies of drugs by medical professionals. Once again, we aren't looking for a magic bullet that changes who drug users are. We're just looking to keep them in the daily swing of things, so to speak. And that's what happened with these pilot programs. Those who take drugs prescribed from doctors, raise kids, work jobs, pay taxes, and they do all the other boring stuff that's supposed to go along with life. Now for some of them, safe supply was much more important and resulted in life course changes, like getting out of the sex work industry or reinitiating long lost relationships with estranged family members, which they described as impossible to do before they had safe, legal, affordable supplies. Regulated supply changes people's lives. So we've now got evidence piling up for more than 50 years of studies and experiments across the globe, all of which verifies that decriminalization saves lives and outright legalization with regulation solves a host of other social problems related to drug use. What is the United States waiting for? Now to be fair, there are some cracks finally forming in the United States' century-long hard-nosed stance on drugs. For example, in April of 2021, just months after taking office, Biden released his first year drug policy priorities, which for the first time in history included harm reduction, enhancing harm reduction services that engage and build trust with people who use drugs. That's a huge step. Prior to this, the government had deliberately avoided even using the term harm reduction, so its inclusion means more than you might think. The seven-item list of priorities which Biden listed begins with, quote, number one, expand access to evidence-based treatment, particularly medication for opioid use disorders. We're finally falling in line with the evidence, as slow as it's happening. Two years later, Biden's 2023 budget request to Congress currently includes an investment of $42.5 billion for national drug control program agencies along with $85 million earmarked for CDC evidence-based harm reduction services. What's the most noteworthy is that, despite what you might hear on fringe news outlets, Biden isn't a radical Democrat. He actually has a really long record of endorsing laws and policies which push back against harm reductionist approach. Don't forget, he was a leader in the moves to both create crack mandates, which hurt black communities more than white communities, and to change civil asset forfeiture laws to allow that money to go to local police departments. 
So Biden's updates are notable, if only because they mark a huge change of heart in someone who spent half a century opposing any sort of legalization or decriminalization. But let me say it one more time. Harm reduction and decriminalization is not enough. The legalization and regulation of all drugs is where all of these positive paths eventually lead. Decriminalization, safe supply, legal cannabis, it all points towards a capitalist market. As the evidence continues to pile up, it'll get harder to resist the argument for drug legalization without appearing to be cold-hearted and mean. Drugs should be legal not because we want people to use more drugs, but because we recognize that people always will use drugs, and that providing them a safe supply prevents a ton of social harms. And for anyone who still thinks they just want people to stop using drugs altogether, the evidence, somewhat ironically, also points to legalization there as well. When we have a safe, affordable, legal supply, we often halt our own use. People who want to use drugs deserve to know exactly what we're consuming and in what dosage. We shouldn't have to risk our safety just to get our drugs. We have a long history of consumer education, insufficient as it often is, which should form the foundation of legalization. People can use any drug they wish, but not without being reminded of how to practice responsible use. The question I often get at this point when I'm talking to a classroom or an auditorium full of interested drug users or students is, what would that system look like? And then we take some time to walk through the checks and safeties currently built into similar systems that already exist. Things like licensed supply chains with testing and checking, accountability, labeling, affordable products, secure and sanitary packaging, accessible distributors. This is a lot more than just legalizing drugs. Legalization and regulation also means taking the opportunity to set some of the wrongs perpetuated by the war on drugs right, specifically the harms against particular groups of U.S. citizens. Proceeds from taxation should fund regulation measures and regulatory requirements, along with programs devoted to harm reduction and drug treatment. No problem but they should also be earmarked for programs and facilities supporting underserved communities, the people who the war on drugs has targeted mercilessly for more than a century. Legal, regulated drugs not only ensure safe supply and touch points with medical professionals, but the legal market will also protect future drug users from harms related to ignorance or misinformation. Unlike my generation, who learned about the drugs we took by taking them, or the generation after mine, who learned about the drugs they took from smash that like button YouTube videos created by anyone with a webcam, the next generation might well learn about drugs from labels, from doctors, and eventually from school. Legal regulation will save countless lives from overdose, criminalization, and bankruptcy. And given our huge demand for drugs in the United States, we currently spend upwards of $150 billion every year on illegal drugs anyway, the market will pay for itself, with plenty of cash left over to spend on social programs. But how do we get there? When our kids work hard to win a race or ace a test, dopamine is released in their brains. These neurotransmitters reinforce the benefits of working hard to achieve goals. Cannabis and marijuana imitates this response so our kids get the reward sensation without the effort. It ultimately robs our kids of the necessary motivation to competitively apply their talents and abilities. When I was a kid, I not only learned that cannabis is a gateway drug, addictive and deadly, I also learned that it was morally reprehensible to use it. Now, of course, I don't feel that way anymore. I smoke a lot of weed. But that's because I'm a product of my environment. The U.S. has updated its opinions on cannabis, an incredibly fast in historical context. That only happened because we saw the shop show up in legit locations run by tax-paying owners, and because we saw money start flowing into state budgets. Colorado has already made more than $2 billion from marijuana since it began taxing it in 2014. That's enough cash to do a lot of good, and it shouldn't be limited to just marijuana. If you go into one of these shops where they sell pot, you'll notice a lot of products, an unbelievable amount considering they're just selling weed. 
There are gummies and tongue drops and gels and oils, wax and shatter, and even something called caviar, which is just multiple forms of cannabis all mixed together into a sticky mess. It feels a lot like capitalism when you walk in there, something we really like in the U.S., and it feels like it's helping people because of all the stories we see on the news and on specials. It helps with seizure disorders, anxiety disorders, depression, autism, ADHD, chemotherapy, dietary issues. The list goes on and on. That list is a recipe for how to do the same thing with other drugs. The stigma currently attached to things like crack cocaine and PCP make for a hard discussion with naysayers. They don't want that shit legalized. But right now, people feel a lot different about drugs like ketamine and MDMA than they did 20 years ago. Not because we've changed our minds about recreational drug use, but because we've been given an alternative narrative about these drugs. One that again plays on both capitalism and on helping people. MDMA, also known as Molly if you were born after 1995, or ecstasy if you were born before 1995, it's showing tremendous potential as a therapeutic drug when administered before a counseling session because it lowers the body's natural resistance to discussing traumatic memories, allowing therapists to guide patients through otherwise evaded traumatic experiences. Ketamine is opening a whole nother doorway to glutamate drugs for depression. It instigates neurogenesis and reduces depression immediately. Such stories will eventually lead to legalization and regulation. There's no reason they can't be stories about all drugs. Sure, all drugs have potential effects that we might not want to deal with. But most drugs also have some effects that make people want to use them, sometimes regularly. We can't change humans, but we can change how humans do their drugs. I'll do an entire episode sometime in the future about what legalization would actually look like and how you would buy these products. But before we can even consider moving to the place where cocaine and heroin are for sale in a Walgreens, we'll need to change the way that people think about cocaine and heroin. That's the real trick. But I don't think it's as difficult as it sounds. Love yourselves and the addicted people in your life. I'm Ben Boyce. For too many years, the ideological opposition to harm reduction has cost lives. British Columbia has been the epicenter of the overdose crisis and substance use harms for several years now. Despite the best efforts in increasing harm reduction, the crisis has worsened. The increasingly toxic, illicit drug supply has exacerbated the already heartbreaking loss of life. More needs to be done here in British Columbia and across the country. If you're still here, you might want more. So consider checking out my book, Dr. Junkie, One Man's Story of Addiction and Crime That Will Challenge Everything You Know About the War on Drugs. You can get it wherever you buy books. If you want to know what the world would look like if drugs were legal, or why we develop tolerance and sensitization to drugs when we take them for extended periods, or if you just want to know why I went to prison, check out the book. 